You're listening to Conferences Online Allergy from Children's Mercy Hospital in Kansas City, Missouri. Today is September 18, 2023. Our topic today, Immunotherapy and the Updated Practice Parameters. Our presenter is Dr. Ann Ellis. She's a professor and chair in the Division of Allergy Immunology at Queen's University in Kingston, Ontario, Canada. She's also a representative on the Joint Task Force for Practice Parameters. All right, well, thank you for inviting me again um, to talk about immunotherapy. Um, I'm going to be, we do have an upcoming uh, traditional practice parameter uh, on immunotherapy. It's still in pieces in draft form, so um, you won't hear a whole lot of crazy updates today, but I will give you a sneak peek at the very end. So these are my disclosures. I'm a clinician scientist. I, I do an awful lot of clinical trials. Um, so I do wind up with a fair amount of um, activity related to pharma industry and particularly the people who make immunotherapy. So I think what's most relevant to disclose is I've worked with um, ALK as well as Stallergen's Greer uh, in the past. So um, we're going to focus on environmental immunotherapy today. So obviously the main target, your, uh, the reason why we prescribe Excuse it, me for interrupting. Yeah. Your, your slides are not advancing. Oh, they're advancing on my screen. Hmm. Maybe if you go to presentation mode, will that change it? Because currently we're seeing kind of the left tab with all the slides. Kind of the bottom right, there's a projection screen. That's I'm seeing allergic rhinitis now. Okay, I got it now. Yep. Okay, I just okay. restarted the share screen, so or the okay. um, slideshow. So thank you. So just let me know if it pauses again for any reason. Will do. Thanks. Sorry to interrupt. No worries, no, it's important to actually see my slides. Um, so again, allergic rhinitis is the most common form of non-infectious rhinitis. It's characterized by uh, runny nose, post-nasal drip, sneezing, nasal blockage, and nasal itching. Um, it's often associated with ocular symptoms as well. And uh, the area guidance loves, loves to try to make this intermittent versus persistent. In reality, we still tend to talk about seasonal versus perennial. Um, and obviously, perennial low means the different things depending on where you live in the country. Um, has, it does, obviously, there's no morbidity associated with allergic rhinitis, but it does have a huge, um, a certain mortality, but it does have a huge burden of disease. Um, we've got issues with it impairing our quality of life. It interferes with sleep, uh, school performance, and work performance. So again, traditionally, we do think about it as seasonal versus perennial, and uh, seasonal allergic rhinitis having mainly being driven by wind-pollinated um, species, such as trees, grass. In Canada, ragweed, at least in this part of Canada, ragweed's a very common issue. And obviously, that gives symptoms in the spring and fall. And in Canada, we have a winter, so we get a break, but some of the southern states never get a break. Um, perennial allergic rhinitis, traditionally, we think of it as being driven by things you never get away from, like dust mites, cockroaches, molds, and animal dander if you've not uh, removed them from your home. And this becomes a more chronic condition and can be harder to treat. So home life is affected in up to 40% of allergic rhinitis patients, mainly because of its impact on sleep. Uh, nasal congestion and obstruction leads to sleep difficulty. A lot of patients with bad AR have microarousals, irregular breathing, and 10% will actually have frank obstructive sleep apnea. Um, so as a result, they have trouble falling asleep, they take more sedatives, they experience nocturnal awakenings, they feel like they didn't get enough sleep, or they still feel tired after waking. And that leads to, in children, poor school performance. Uh, the symptoms themselves can be distracting for the child at school. Um, when you add that to the fact they didn't get a good night's sleep, they have decreased concentration. Um, they do actually miss days of school uh, with due to their allergies, and it's been shown to impair learning just by having them in the first place. And if you add in first-generation sedating antihistamines, that will impair their cognition even further. It's important to recognize the relationship between allergic rhinitis and asthma. Again, allergic rhinitis is a very prevalent uh, condition, and up to 80% of asthmatics will also have allergic rhinitis. And similarly, about 20 to 30% of patients with allergic rhinitis will also have asthma. And we know that if their allergic rhinitis is not well controlled, that can lead to flares of asthma and poor asthma control. So when you're treating your asthmatic patients, don't forget to look in the nose and, and think about the nose as well. So this is hot off the press in, in, in Canada. 
this is our new, this is not yet published, so I wanted to put a big impress over, copy, over top of it, but this is our new diagnostic and management algorithm from, from our new updated Canadian rhinitis guidelines, um, where our systematic review of the literature showed that, in fact, diagnostic testing, if serum-specific IgE is actually elevated, it's equivalent in terms of making the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis compared to the standard skin prick test. We asked that question specifically because of a lot of serum-specific IgE being measured during the pandemic when we couldn't see patients in, in person and we couldn't do skin testing. So when you've confirmed the diagnosis of allergic rhinitis, we've got our pharmaceutical therapies. Really, any of them can be considered first line, but we've listed them in order of efficacy. So the darker the blue is, the more uh, effective they are based on the trials that we found. Pertin realized that leukotriene receptor antagonists are only uh, indicated for seasonal allergic rhinitis, but uh, really not, a combination. Yep. We're not advancing again. We're still back on allergic rhinitis. Sorry. Oh. Okay. I'll just pop my camera on if it happens again. I, I apologize for having to interrupt you, though. No worries. Okay. Let's go back here. Is that on, advancing now? Uh, it's on complications. I didn't see it advancing. You've passed that. So you're not seeing the builds here on school performance or AR and asthma? No, I'm not. Okay, okay now we're on allergic rhinitis asthma relationship. Okay. And do you see this figure? Uh, I see it like a two circle diagram. I'm not to the algorithm yet. Okay. So. Maybe what I'll do. I did send my slides through to Miriam. Yeah, and, and I do have access to those and with a little bit of work, I can get that if need be. Is that working now? Um, where do I see the algorithm. Yeah, so that's just going to be a little bit slow because if I exit and then restart the show okay. from the next slide, that seems to work. Um, so again, we wanted to make sure that um, people could consider immunotherapy at any point. Um, so you can use it in combination with pharmaceutical therapy at any point across the spectrum. And uh, sublingual immunotherapy and subcutaneous immunotherapy are both being recommended. One of the things that we do focus on a lot is that if you're going to use antihistamines uh, for the treatment of allergic rhinitis, we recommend only using uh, newer antihistamines, the second generation agents, because of the safety issues that are associated with first-generation antihistamines like diphenhydramine, uh, not only do they cause sedation, but they do impact cognitive function, leading to actually worse sleep quality. And there have also been issues of deaths due to accidents, overdoses, and even sudden cardiac death. So it's important, especially in children, this is when I really jump on my soapbox, uh, because of the fact that allergic rhinitis alone can lead to increased chance of poor school performance, that gets even worse if the uh, child is taking a sedating antihistamine. So if we look at a traditional treatment period for pyramid for patients with asthma and rhinitis, uh, you're more likely to consider immunotherapy in more moderate to severe uh, rhinitis, whereas in asthma, you're going to consider it earlier so that you don't get into the safety issues uh, with severe asthma. So allergen immunotherapy has been around for a very long time. Uh, it was invented initially in 1911, um, and subcutaneous immunotherapy, or what patients refer to as allergy shots, have been established as an effective treatment of IgE-mediated reactions to stinging insects, like you already heard from Dr. Golden, allergic rhinitis, as well as allergic asthma. And immunotherapy really is the aim is to decrease allergen sensitive sensitivity via gradual administration of increasing doses of allergen extracts. We've had lots of advances since it was first invented, and including improved quality of extracts, standardized extracts, and a better understanding of the underlying immune mechanisms and why it works. Uh, we do know it modifies the immune response from an allergic inflammatory pattern to a more protective, less damaging response. And that immunotherapy and allergen avoidance are the only treatments that actually modify the natural history of allergic disease, inducing remission and or long-term cure. When it comes to asthma, this has been confirmed through three different meta-analyses of randomized controlled trials of immunotherapy for patients with allergic asthma. 
Uh, the most recent, which is actually quite old now, but it did include 75 trials with over 3,500 patients of various allergens. And really did make an improvement in symptom reduction. Um, depending on the studies and how they reported, you could either see an overall standardized mean difference in symptom scores of minus uh, set 0.7. Um, but if the studies reported it simply as they're better, the same or worse, the overall number needed to treat was only four to prevent one asthma deterioration. And if you're looking specifically at pollen, number needed to treat is three. So that's really impressive numbers when you compare that to some of the other therapies that we have on the market. So dosing in subcutaneous immunotherapy is, is challenging sometimes because efficacy is definitely dose dependent. And really, you want to target the highest tolerated dose for optimal efficacy. The units can be confusing. Um, obviously, we've got PNU, BAU, weight per volume, um, AU. Um, and we have a Canadian uh, immunotherapy manual that uh, is even helpful for U.S. trainees, and it's available online. Uh, we get a lot of requests uh, for access to this, but now we just put it up free on our website as a way to improve access to anybody. Um, Oops, shoot. Sorry, this is working because I, but it's just a pain because I have to do this each time. Okay, so if you go to the CSACI website uh, and go click on education resources, you can see IT manual is right there. And these are some of the content that gives you a sense of what we cover. Um, so we've got, you know, how the standard, how the allergens are standardized. We talk about every biology and what's important in different geographies. We've also got instructions on how to mix allergens and what the target doses should be for each of them. And then we've added, an, uh, obviously, a section on sublingual immunotherapy, uh, which focuses on the uh, Health Canada and FDA-approved slit tablets. This one. So as I mentioned, the units can be a bit confusing. So biological allergen units or BAUs, that's for the standardized extracts, which we have for uh, grass mix, cat, and both house dust mite species. All of the other ones are either ordered as PNU or weight per volume for non-standardized extract, which is basically everything else. Um, and that does get a bit tricky when you're trying to reorder because lot to lot variation of PNU is something to be aware of particularly when you're starting from a new vial. That's why we usually do a dose reduction as a safety precaution in case something's changed with a different amount of PNU that you ordered from the manufacturer. So in terms of prescribing skit, what you want is you're going to pick what you really want to have in your final target dose of your 0.5 cc dose from your maintenance vial. Um, manufacturers will then do serial dilutions and three to four vial sets are the most common. Buildup is typically done weekly or biweekly over four to six months. Rush protocols are available but not widely used due to the increased risk of um, adverse reactions from the same. So in terms of the targets that we list in our manual, um, we typically will recommend 1,000 to 1,500 BAUs of house dust mite, 3,000 of grass, trees, and ragweed, sometimes higher doses depending on um, how sensitized the patient is, and cat typically is 2,000 to 2,500 BAUs. Dogs and molds are less well characterized, particularly up until recently we didn't have access to AP dog. That has come back now, which is a bit more robust of a response. Um, so we'll be updating our manual to discuss uh, the role of AP dog in, in prescriptions. And this is a typical schedule that comes right from the manufacturer. But you can always, of course, make your own schedule that you prefer to have your patients follow if you wish. So immunotherapy we know is effective, um, but unfortunately, a lot of patients who would be can good candidates for subcutaneous immunotherapy either don't take it or they discontinue it prematurely. And it's really because of that requirement for regular office visits to receive injections as cited as the number one reason for not accepting or discontinuing SCIT. Obviously, the major drawback is the risk of systemic allergic reactions, which is why it has to be given in a physician's office and why you have to wait for half an hour every, after every injection. Depending on which study you read, approximately 1% to 5% of patients will have systemic reactions. 
Um, anaphylaxis, as CORE does, about one per thousand injections. But fortunately, the risk of death is extremely low. And it's even lower than this now. David Bernstein uh, hasn't published it yet, but he did verbally at a presentation. It's probably more like one in seven million that are lead to fatalities. But because of the inconvenience of SCIT and the, the fact that many people discontinue prematurely, uh, that led to the introduction of the standardized sublingual immunotherapy tablets. It has the advantage of home dosing, so it leads to a huge increase in convenience, lower out-of-pocket costs to the patient in terms of parking, time away from work, um, et cetera. Um, there's increased safety. Local side effects are quite common, but systemic reactions are extremely rare. Um, I know in the States, you're required to co-prescribe an epinephrine auto-injector, but in Canada, it's considered optional because the risk is so low. Um, these sublingual tablets have very proven efficacy. As a class, they're about 30% better than placebo, which doesn't sound that great, but when you compare in the same type of meta-analyses, antihistamines are only 6% better than, it, than placebo. You almost wonder why we even prescribe them. Um, and nasal steroids is about 17% better. And again, uh, the, the advantage of sublingual immunotherapy is you do have potential for disease modification, whereas uh, medications do not. We know that you have to be on both for at least two years to have uh, persistent benefit. And after two years of treatment, their efficacy is, com is completely comparable. Um, after only one year, SCIT is a little bit better than SLIT. But by two years, uh, they're equal. And uh, they're available for grass, ragweed, hostess mite. And recently in Canada, we have birch and other trees um, that we can prescribe. So, and I do have some patients who are on four tablets um, at, from time to time. So in terms of the evidence base, there's been an extensive clinical trial development program for all the approved products. Uh, both Airwarelair and GrassTech uh, have been on the Canadian market since uh, 2015, actually. Um, so obviously, Aurelair is the five grass tablet manufactured by Stallergens. Grastech is just straight up Timothy grass. Um, because of the fact there is such high degree of cost activity within the pasture grasses, treating with just Timothy is, is more than sufficient. Ragwitech is ragweed. Obviously, in the States, you've got Odactra for house dust mite. We have a different name for it in, in Canada, but that's okay. And then in Canada, we have Atulatec, which treats approved for the treatment of birch, alder, and hazel uh, tree pollen as well. So let's quickly go through um, just like a one or two slides about the efficacy of each of these. Uh, this is looking at the Timothy grass uh, sublingual tablet as well as a five grass sublingual tablet. Um, again, either pre co-seasonal treatment or all year round treatment for grass tech was how they designed the study. And this just shows the benefit that persists even after you stop the tablet entirely after three years of treatment, they're still showing clinical benefit. Um, it'd be interesting to see if we had any benefit beyond the, the fifth year, but obviously that gets expensive to follow patients that much. But um, so we do say you want to do at least three years and we know you'll get two extra years of benefit beyond that. So this is um, sample slide data from the Ragwitech, the Ragwitech tablet. Um, you can see when you look at the overall group, there was, depending on the dose, and again, it's a 12 MBA1 dose that's been brought to the market, 23% uh, reduction in symptoms compared to placebo. Um, and it was interesting, we did an analysis just looking at the Canadian subpopulation. You could see it was even more effective in Canada uh, with a 40% reduction in, with the higher dose, which is the one that's now on the market. This is this, the key data for the, uh, I, I'll accidentally called it Kerazax, but it is Odactra is what you're familiar with it by that name, uh, showing an 18% reduction compared to placebo, statistically significant and very robust in terms of the FDA requirement that the 95% uh, confidence interval not cross uh, one. So it's a real result. It's, uh, you can see that obviously the magnitude of benefit, not quite as exciting as what you see with the ragweed tablet, but Again, house dust mite is so much harder to treat because you never ever get away with it, get away from it. So I mentioned the side effects are common, particularly local side effects. Again, but it's generally well tolerated since systemic reactions are rare. About 50% of patients will develop itching under their tongue or the sensation of itchy ears and palate. 
Um, you can remove this side effect by pre-treating with a second generation antihistamine, and it usually resolves after the first two weeks of therapy. So I usually don't pre-treat routinely. I let them take the tablet if they have issues in clinic. Uh, then I'll treat them with an antihistamine at that time and have them take an antihistamine one hour prior to their tablet for the next two weeks. Mild local angioedema, so it's just literally swelling right where the tablet dissolves. Um, it's not, it's well described, but only about 5% of patients experience that. It also usually resolves after the first two weeks of therapy. And again, co-treatment with uh, second generation antihistamine can be helpful. Nausea and vomiting is reported in about 2% of patients. And that's been the one symptom side effect that has actually led my patients to stop sublingulumina therapy uh, if they develop it. Um, we monitor now a little bit more, particularly in children, for the development of eosinophilic esophagitis. It's still a rare complication, but reports are increasing, so I'm always asking questions to screen for possible development of EOE. So in summary, uh, SKIT and SLIT are both effective options for patients who fail pharmacotherapy or wish to avoid long-term medical management. Um, the devil in the details is obviously a, sometimes a challenge when it comes to um, coming up with the exact prescription, but your training programs and uh, as I said, the CSACI manual is a very helpful resource. And as I alluded to at the beginning, the Joint Task Force on, on Immunotherapy in a Traditional Format is on the way. We've got about three quarters of, this, of the sections have had a first draft. Um, some of the things I can sort of highlight that'll be exciting is um, really interesting new developments in mechanisms and um, why immunotherapy works and what it does to the in the immune system. A uh, huge huge uh, steps forward since the last time this topic was reviewed, and we're going to be doing an in-depth uh, comparison of SKIT versus SLIT, as well as uh, making sure that people feel familiar with the the challenges of multi-allergen uh, SKIT as well. So with that, I will. Thank you for your attention, and I'm sorry that for whatever reason this sharing didn't seem to work very well. I'll blame it on Teams. Thank you. <laughs> not not the first complaint we've had on Teams. Sorry about that. <laughs> we're, we're kind of stuck with it from our uh, hospital policy. Um, all right. Thanks for the, the talk. I'll open it up to the, the crowd for questions. So when do we expect the practice parameters to be pushed out? It's a great question. Um, as I alluded to, uh, of our writing group, about three quarters of the people have submitted first drafts, some of which have already been revised and are pretty much in, in final stages. So um, depends on if we keep our momentum going. I would imagine, though, sometime by early Q, uh, Q1 of 2024, um, we should be able to, to get it rounded out and ready for review by the whole task force. So once once we write it as a writing group, a first draft, it'll go to the full task force for review and then back to us again um, for, for final revisions. And then once it's approved by the task force, then it's got to go off to the parent organizations for their kick at the cat at it as well. <laughs> okay. I, I recognize it's a huge undertaking to have these done. So appreciate that you're part of that. Um, um, I'm going to just mention something that we've noticed locally with our extract provider. Um, they are in the process of changing out a lot of the concentrations, um, and a lot of things are now half um, uh, dilutions, we'll say. So the 1 to 10s are now 1 to 20s. Everything's getting glycerinated. I don't know if other manufacturers are doing the same, but we're getting to the point where if we're to meet the recommended doses, and this is mostly on the weight per volume um, extracts, um, it's near impossible to get away with just one or two shots these days, um, and it's even more complicated if you obviously if you add dog into it. So, um, do you have any thoughts on what's going on with that? Yeah, it's challenging. I've got a few patients where you know I'm trying to order a ten uh, an eight ml maintenance vial, and they said there's not enough volume for all the numbers, all the stuff you're putting in there. Um, so then we try to work around that by making a ten ml um, maintenance vial. And that, so there's room for a little bit of diluent in there as well. Um, but yeah, I can see how that could be an issue because at the end of the day, you've got 10 NLs to work with. And if they're diluting everything down on you, you might yeah. be stuck having to use three or four vials altogether rather than just one or two. Yeah. It's David. Not... Yeah, great talk. Thank you very much. Um, I, I, I guess I have a couple of thoughts about the, the weight volume and PNU. Uh, one of the things that, that you uh, said early on was about variability. 
in, in, in lots of lot variability. Uh, and you you were talking at the time of a PNU, uh, but the extracts themselves, of course, are are um, crude extracts. They have uh, other than the standardized ones, there's going to be obviously significant variability in the uh, weight volume extracts just as much as the same extract, uh, depending on, uh, we, you know, standardizing it, so to speak, for PNU. Uh, you have believers and non-believers. That, that's not the point. But I just wanted to mention that the, the weight volume doesn't necessarily get you away from that uh, lot to lot variability. And it's much more for certain allergens uh, than, than for other allergens. No, that's a good point as well. I guess the reason why I focused on PNU is because that's how I order everything. Me too. So I don't do anything by weight for volume. I either get VAUs or PNUs, and then the and the manufacturers just remind me, you know, I can't guarantee you that exact number that you've asked for. So, um, mm -hmm. but yeah, at the I must admit I I got away from weight per volume a long time ago because the to me PNUs just made easier math. <laughs> it does. Then um, I, we also have the um, Hollister Steer um, change. They're going from their AP dog to the ultra filtered. Mm. Yes. Anything we need to be aware of with that change? Yeah, I saw that with the Quad AI. I had to go up and ask them what, 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 what all that meant. Um, we don't have any availability to order it in Canada. Um, so at this point, I'm kind of beholden by what the reps tell me at the, uh, at the, uh, at the meetings. Okay. Yeah, it's um what we ourselves we're, we don't use that product currently, and our our group doesn't want to mix different manufacturers, so um it's it's not a direct issue for me, but it could be for those online who might use their product. So I was curious. Okay, um any other questions from the audience? Hey, just practically real quick. So, you know, a lot of patients are getting like sub-Q, like IT, like we bring them into clinic and you wait the 30 minutes. For patients who are starting slit, like for the first few doses, do you have them kind of come into clinic before they do home, um, you know, like home like home dosing? Just kind of yeah, great, practical question. great question. I, I can't believe I forgot to put that in the slide. So, yeah, the first dose you give, in, you give under observation in your office for 30 minutes, um, and then I let them take it at home the next day. And, and thereafter. Um, restarts, we got some good experience with home restarts. Uh, technically for product monograph, you're supposed to bring them back to the office when you, if you're treating pre-co-seasonally, um, and you need to have the first dose then again be given in your office. Um, but what I've been doing is if the first dose with me, let's say a Ragwitech in April, um, they don't have any local side effects. I'm like, okay, then you're good to just start this up again next April on your own. But if they do have some local reaction, then I'll bring them back to, to have their first dose again with me the next time. Um, Karazax or Adactra is so much easier because you start it and you just never stop it until you're done. So you don't have to worry about gaps for restarts. So, um, But I did a lot of restarts through telemedicine during the pandemic. Just talk to them on the phone now. So so go ahead. And you feel you feeling anything? Nope. Okay. Call me back if you have a problem. <laughs> Perfect. Thank you. I guess I was a little bit curious, and this is just, I, I was wondering in Europe, are there any major differences in how they handle allergen immunotherapy compared to AIT here? Very much so. Um, so the Europeans really are not fans of multi-allergen skit. Um, they try to pick what are the most problematic items for the patient. And they usually only have one allergen in each of their injections. So there's a lot of uh, monotherapy uh, done in Europe. So you either get grass or you get whatever the, tr the local tree is that's causing issues. Um, and they think uh, what we do in North America is, is a little bit bonkers by putting so many allergens in the same vial. Yeah, I, I think they're the rationale. I wonder if part of what's behind that uh, is simply um, their environment and their climate. Uh, mo where are most of those studies done? They're done in uh, England and in Scandinavia, uh, where you have birch and grass, and pretty much that's it. Yeah. Uh, and, and to some extent, Canada is different than the U.S. also. Uh, and, and even within the U.S., there are going to be all these differences. But uh, I tried really hard over the years to say, oh, well, your big problem is oak, uh, and I'm only going to give you oak. And they were improved, but they weren't great at all until we added in the other three or four significant trees because we have all those different trees uh, 
And, and it was mainly in the trees. That, you know, the grass is grass and ragweed is ragweed. Um, but uh, I, I think that's a difference on the slit tree tablet also is the application in the U.S. Uh, may be good but not good enough for that same reason. Yeah, we did show at the, the, the phase, the biggest phase three trial with the Tulatech did show some benefit against oak, but not mm -hmm. enough for Health Canada to put it on the label. Okay, well, great discussion, great presentation. Uh, Dr. Ellis, we do appreciate you contributing once again to COLA. Um, and Thanks everyone, have a great afternoon. Okay, thank you all, all right.